The feminist movement in South Korea is a very multifaceted aspect of it. It's deep ties with the, uh, this pro-democracy movement and the labor rights movement back in the days. The creed of the Bobby movement is intense and more condensed and more outspoken version of all the grievances and frustrations voiced by uh, a lot of single and childless women in South Korea. <laughs> You know what they say, men can't live with them. Prior to this year, Man vs. Bear was the title of an obscure 2019 Discovery Channel program and nothing else. The phrase would normally refer to man's weakness in the face of one of nature's most potent, strongest creatures. Aside from that, a joke about Leonardo DiCaprio and The Revenant, maybe. But today, today it shares the fate of just about every other combination of words in the English language. It's social media discourse, baby. Like many others, this one started with a street interview. Would you rather be stuck in a forest with a man or a bear? Bear. Man is scary. Um, with a bear. What I've heard about bears, they don't always attack you, right? Unless you, like, fuck with them. So maybe a bear. <laughs> Pro depends what man, but probably a bear. 100% oh, a bear, which is, like, terrifying to say, but... These women's answers, like lightning bolts, shocked some and electrified others. As many of you can tell, I'm a dude. Uh, a guy, a man, if you will. To some men, not me, but um, other men. This was the latest installment in an ongoing cultural decay, in which women are trained to disrespect and disregard the importance of masculinity, hating men despite needing them for order and protection and stuff like that. Many women, on the other hand, just found this as a humorous addition to the ongoing online gender wars. A new way to articulate just how dangerous men often are in a systemically unfair world. A lot of this became laughing at people for taking this offhand discourse all too seriously, especially under the assumption of threats to morality and social structure. I'm, I'm just gonna say it's goofy for men to rage online about how women are ungrateful. They got so angry that they were like, why wouldn't you, why would you pick a bear? Why wouldn't you be, what, what, are you out of your mind? Are you stupid? Why wouldn't you want to be left alone with a random man, you stupid bitch? <laughs> it's funny to make slideshows of zesty bears in opposition to AI-generated images of creepy pretty boys sets to He Chose Me by Too Short. But there is always room for a serious conversation that nerds like me can make video essays about. What do the statistics say? Why do women find men to be so scary in so many situations? Is it unfair? These conversations live as a never-ending through line in online gender wars debates. And maybe the most serious site of this ideological conflict is in the 4B movement. So the misogyny and patriarchy has gotten so bad in South Korea that the young women are participating in this movement that they're calling the 4B movement. Like the 4B movement? Is that not of the devil? Like literally women all over the world have decided that if the choice is to be married to a man who treats us like nothing or the population dying off, we will let it die off. I think the men are becoming afraid because they're realizing a woman's power. You're going to have to do the one thing you have been avoiding the whole time, and that is change and become a better man if you ever want to be with any one of these women. No one is settling for you anymore. So let's talk about the 4B movement. 4B 운동이란 무엇인가? The story of the 4B movement starts in South Korea, but the curiosity surrounding it today in the West feels very much its own animal. In some ways, it started here, with a TikToker named Genie. As Genie describes it, this movement is a cultural phenomenon in South Korea that is at least exacerbating low birth rates in the country, all sourcing back to women being so done with men. It's like really bad. But I just think that's so fucking funny. That's also very Korean. Like, Korean as an ethnicity is about to go away, and Korean women are literally just like... <laughs> B in Korean is no, I don't speak Korean, this is just what I've learned. And the four Bs of the movement include P sexu or no sex with men, P chorsan or no child rearing, P yone, no dating men, and P hon, no marriage with men. 
Since this TikTok went viral, many American women are championing the cause and its potential widening into an international movement, often going back and forth with the men's rights red pill crowd as a sort of performed debate. Feminism is going to lead these women into dating each other. This is not going to benefit you in any way. This just screams you hate men. Sweetheart, it's not about misandry. It's not about us hating men. It's about us expecting men to evolve and be better and you choosing not to. Naturally, we have already seen responses to the responses. Perhaps most notably, some people are taking to critique this as a type of Western sensationalism that is not at all indicative of what's really going on in Korea. Namely, there's this TikTok by content creator Anna Lee who says that trends of Korean women trying to get married are far more prevalent. All the conversations that I have with my friends around my age is about, oh my god, we we're looking to get married, we need to find good partners, and we need to do this before it gets too late or we're just like aged out of their marriage market. There are services in Korea like marriage matchmaking services where people go and you pay a broker. People go to these marriage services and they're heavily used. There are literally so many in the country because everyone is using them and so the 4b movement in korea is a very very small fraction of the whole korean population in general it's just the western media likes to highlight that part and make it seem like it's the biggest issue in korea which it really really is not in that tiktok she also refers to 4b activists as extreme radical misandrists who face off with extreme radical misogynists most people in korea still like the other sex, we want to date, we want to find love, we want to get married. Those are like the big majority. And it's only the small group of extreme radical misandrists and extreme radical misogynists. They just seem like the loudest because, because the most attention goes to them. Her comment section is an extremely fun mixed bag. Some are disgusted with her seeming lack of solidarity with people standing for women's rights in her country. Some think she is a much needed voice against Western sensationalism. Some say, yeah, that's my experience too. And some say, actually, I'm also from Korea and I think you're making this look a little smaller than it actually is. In my research, I've found that as far as the state of gender in South Korea for real for real, all these reactions are kind of right in a way. It is part of a response to societal misogyny. It is also, as far as the devotees of it go, yes, part of the movement, a fringe part of the movement, you can even say. My last video, whoop. My last video, the one about the blockout celebrities trend, included analyzing the difference between a trend and a movement, and why that's important. The 4B movement, as far as I have seen, and we'll get into it, is ultimately another trend that's improperly labeled as a movement. Not quite a movement in itself, although part of what is in many ways a movement. But as I said in that video, a trend is not at all worthless to examine. If it was, my channel would be worthless. And even if that were true, I would not admit it in a video. Trends show us different cultural reactions and conversations in response to larger phenomena. And that's what the 4B movement does as well. 4B is a small part of a larger conflict in South Korea. It is definitely not the reason why birth rates are dwindling, and I actually have a serious concern about any narrative purporting that a group of radical feminists online are the reason why Korea's birth rates are going down. I don't like where that narrative is going. What I think is happening is actually a conflation that results from a lack of praxis. Y'all are not being properly educated on what's really going on with gender in South Korea. The first thing we should do is try to rectify that. The thing is, you know, the South Korea's birth rate crisis is a really complex issue. It's really hard to just single out just one reason behind it. It's a really combination of a lot of social factors behind it. This is Ha Won Jung author of Flowers of Fire, the inside story of South Korea's feminist movement and what it means for women's rights worldwide. An experienced journalist who has reported extensively on gender issues and the feminist movement in South Korea, which burgeoned in the mid-2010s, she expressed surprise to me that the topic had caught on so much in the U.S. The Bobby movement itself kind of emerged in South Korea a long time ago, around 2019 and 18. Back when the Bobby movement first emerged, South Korea was still in the midst of the feminist movement through the, the late 2010s and the early 2020s. So there was a lot of momentum for the movement. The first thing we should point out about the 4B movement and the greater feminist wave of the 2010s is that it has seemingly died down in recent years at least in terms of being championed in the public eye. 
Surging from the Me Too movement, this wave of Korean feminism tackled issues from outright harassment and individualized discrimination women regularly faced to beauty standard issues with movements like Escape the Corset. But perhaps the greatest successes that feminists have had in South Korea in recent times surround a hot button issue that is pretty specific to the country. The issue of morka. Morka or illegal spy cam footage of women, often taken in bathrooms and always without their consent or knowledge. Howland's book Flowers of Fire begins with a scene from July 7th, 2018 in Seoul, where thousands of women rallied in protest against the rapidly increasing proliferation of spy cam footage, which the country had done very little to monitor or punish. Molka, filming us illegally. Those bastards who filmed them. Those who share them, those who watch them, those who sell them, punish them right now. Kim, a 21-year-old college student, chanted with the others, thousands of fists shooting up towards the sky in unison, moving rivers of red-clad figures endlessly streamed out of the nearby subway station and chartered buses from all across the country, joining the sea of protesters brandishing handwritten banners that declared, my life is not your porn. An angry woman will change the world. One of the more optimistic parts of the conversation I had with Hawan was about the changes this feminist wave brought to South Korea's legal system with regards to Morka. In 2020, the Nth Room Prevention Laws, named after a multi-year scandal with a group chat on Telegram that involved cyber sex trafficking and Morka distribution, made deep fake corn, a sex crime which would now be more highly punished. Additionally, it made the possession and viewing of non-consensual pornographic materials more punishable with potentially years of imprisonment. Morka blackmail became punishable with imprisonment. Sending around sexually explicit images without consent became criminally punishable. Major tech platforms and websites became liable for hosting such content. And the age of consent was raised from 13, Jesus Christ Korea, to 16, which is still like what are we doing the fight against sexual harassment and abuse of women aided by technology i think south korea is way ahead of other countries in terms of the how commonplace such crimes are but also how vigorously women are fighting against that and i think at least on paper now south korea has one of the most progressive sets of law against to fight against such crimes in the world mm. Truly, South Korea's feminist wave had a huge impact. A lot of the attention internationally has been brought to online trends and scenes from rallies, which were important parts, of course. But Hawan tells me that if you were on the ground, you'd know that throughout the country, women were starting up feminist cafes, feminist bookstores where talks were given, even clubs to play sports together or to go biking. So why does it seem to have died down? Howell notes the role of the COVID-19 pandemic in shutting down small businesses and declines in in-person gatherings, but also it was the rise of anti-feminist politics, especially online, which culminated in the opportunistic Yoon suk to use anti-feminist politics to win the 2022 presidential election. Calling it just an old saying that women are treated unequally and men are treated better, Yoon's notably unpopular presidency has nonetheless included the abolition of the Ministry for Gender Equality. In South Korea, feminism has always been a dirty word and you know, women who publicly say that I'm a feminist always ran the, had this risk of being marginalized, being bullied or being stigmatized in their workplaces or in school. But things have gotten a lot worse the term gender equality or the feminism have become something of a public taboo in a lot of public and private spheres. And, you know, a lot of politicians stopped talking about the term gender equality or feminism or women's rights or violence against women altogether. The education ministry even decided to remove the term gender equality or sexual minority from the school textbooks and uh, government budgets and the you know, pro public projects in support of women's rights or for women's shelters or women's headlines for domestic violence. The victims have really almost disappeared. And as a result, a lot of uh, the, the women who are really are spoken about violence against women or gender inequality in the country have kind of felt very intimidated, scared, and a lot of them have fallen silent, including the followers of the Bobby movement as well. 
So it's a really disheartening development, but that's a reality, a reality faced by a lot of women in South Korea right now. I bring all this context up because a lot of what we discourse about and think about when it comes to activism is young people mostly gathering together on social media to trend hashtags and have discourse. Stuff like the 4B movement, even. And again, I obviously think that those things are worth talking about, but these online trends hardly encompass an entire movement. Movements are built by people who organize. They hold rallies, they hold events, they create spaces. When online trends like 4B take precedent in how we discuss a country's politics and society, we do that society a disservice. Indeed, even 4B itself is, as Hawan puts it, a small part of a much larger cultural moment for women, in which the idea of getting married to a man and raising his children is both less desirable and less possible than ever. The Kobe movement and these followers are at the extreme end of the whole spectrum of women who remain single and childless in South Korea. And to be fair, not a lot of women who remain childless and the single see their lifestyle as some sort of political activism or political statement like the followers of the 4B movements do. One of the more popular terms relating to this is marriage strike. In one survey, 65% of women said they don't want children, as opposed to 48% of men. Another recent poll found that 47% of women respondents between 19 and 49 said they wanted to get married. That's less than half. And you gotta say, this is a problem with regards to the way our societies are organized, especially South Korean society, for instance. Young people buy the most things, they work the longest hours and the most difficult jobs the most often, they take care of the elderly populations. South Korea's dwindling birth rate means less and less young people. As Hawan wrote in a New York Times piece, about half of the country's 228 cities, counties, and districts risk losing so many residents they might vanish. Of course, one of the most common responses that people will have to stuff like this is to scold young people, especially young women. Just have sex. Just have kids. It's what we did. Your country depends on you to do it. But that's exactly the problem, isn't it? Conceiving and birthing a child is very painful and often even dangerous to a woman's health. And that's before the kid comes out. Then the kid comes out and you gotta raise it for 20 something years. Anybody who tells you, eh, parenting wasn't actually that difficult. They were probably really bad parents. It's supposed to be very difficult. It's supposed to be something that you put a lot of energy and effort into, that you make a lot of sacrifices and endure a lot of things for. It's literally lives at stake. <gasps> I'm pregnant. Sally, stop it! I told him he could! So, to do something like that well, you need many resources. The thing is, these governments and their proponents want you to have it both ways. They want you to have the kids, take on the sacrifice and responsibility, and they also don't want to make any sacrifices to help you do it. One major indicator of this, of course, is the costs of child rearing. It is hella expensive. Between housing costs, private education costs, and low wages, not only can young Koreans not afford to start families, but they also have no time. South Korea's notorious culture of working long hours has reformed over the years, but not nearly enough to where you can see prospective young parents with proper schedules for children on a consistent basis. And frankly, a culture like that isn't exactly promising for a person to want their child to grow up in it. There is so much competition in nearly every aspect of life, whether, try, whether you are at school or whether you are trying to get a job or whether you are a child. Really, there's so much competition and sort of a, you know, winner takes it all, dog is dog kind of mentality that is really pervasive in, you know, so many aspects of daily lives in South Korea. And a lot of young people seem to believe that you know, this is not a good environment where, you know, a child can grow. And I don't want my child to go through the same things that I went through. Now, this doesn't exactly explain why women are far less excited, enticed, interested in the prospect of family life and child rearing. 
That takes slightly more critical thinking to understand. For one, we know that the woman in the normal heterosexual relationship is the one that gives birth, and the man is, of course, given no such physical burden. You have no idea how much this hurts. <laughs> nor the myriad health complications and social complications that follow. We also know that the woman is traditionally the one to do the vast, vast, vast majority of at-home care and child care, while the man's role is traditionally to be the breadwinner. This in itself is starting to change, and the aforementioned political economy concerns have made this role even less tangibly effective over time, because the jobs ain't paying anyway. And both parents usually have to work a lot to support a child. When you're in a society that, despite ongoing massive economic shifts, where it's harder and harder to get steady paying work and to be able to afford a home, and yet cultural norms remain quite conservative and traditional, as if traditional lifestyles don't require a lot of money, what you have is a recipe for disaster. For one thing, South Korea has a very patriarchal country, and I know this is happening all around the world, including the US. But actually, the situation in South Korea has been somewhat taken to an extreme compared to many other countries in the industrialized world. So much so that even women who are the family breadwinners, even in these families, women still spend more hours on childcare and the household chores than their stay-at-home husbands. In one extreme case, of all the places in the world, South Korea's largest maker of baby formula has been accused for years of firing or demoting their female employees once they had a baby. And this kind of discriminations or career setback faced by a lot of working moms is widely called the child penalty. And one study by the South Korean think tank Korea Development Institute showed that there are at least 40% of the South Korea's birth rate crisis actually attributed to those kind of a child penalty experienced by a lot of women. Out of this cultural landscape uh, emerged a lot of young women who kind of continued or started to say that I don't want it that way. I watched all my life watching my mother shouldering this burden, or I grew up watching my aunties and my older sisters getting fired from their work just because they got married or they had a child or choose to uh, choosing to give up their career. And that's when the, uh, the we had this buzzword called no marriage, which I think it can be roughly translated as so willfully single or willfully unmarried. These women say that, you know, we can maybe we can just not get married and live on our own. Some of these no marriage women even went so far as to say that we are going to boycott the uh, whole, you know, romantic relationship with men. Their argument is not that different from what the 4B movement followers are saying. It's just that, like I said, not a lot of single women see their lifestyle as a political statement. But I think you can say that the 4B movement followers are sort of a symbol of all the grievances and frustration felt by a lot of uh, the women who chose to stay single and childless. Although, again, these four women movement followers are not representative of all the women in South Korea who stay single and childless. Patriarchy is almost everywhere, but as you've probably figured out by this point, South Korea does patriarchy like no one else. To understand how we got here, and to understand online Korean feminism and 4B on a deeper level, we gotta talk about Korean history. Just a little bit. About 600,000 years ago, people started settling on the Korean peninsula. Obviously, we're not going to go over 600,000 years of history in this video, but here are some key points that I was able to glean from a textbook on Korean women's studies, as well as other sources like Hawon's book, Flowers of Fire. See, that's why I'm wearing the flowers shirt, because flowers of fire. I'm not very good at costuming. Since the peninsula was first settled, empires have risen and fallen, but one of the key themes throughout has been patriarchy. At the start, women were at least connected to religion in a significant way. There were even female deities that people celebrated. There were even priestesses and queens even in the region of Sidra. But the growth and consolidation of empires further entrenched them into the newly established private sphere, where they were stuck as unappreciated housekeepers and caretakers. If you're the type of person to believe that there are two genders, I can't say I don't understand why you're wrong, but I understand because here we have evidence in Korea as well as other parts of East Asia of gender roles like ours today many thousands of years back. 
but that doesn't mean these things are naturally entrenched. They still come from social development, political development. This is part of what develops the key differences we understand in cultures, even across Asia. Women's roles worsened as Confucian ideals came to the fore during the uniting of the three kingdoms. What in China was referred to as Sansong Suda, and in Vietnam as Tam Tong Tuduk, in Korea was called Sam Chong Jido. This refers to the three subordinations of a woman, to her father first, then her husband, and eventually her son. On top of that, you also have the four virtues, feminine conduct, feminine speech, feminine comportment, and feminine works. Do things girly, basically. I want to make a key point here. Please take note of this. Confucianism is often brought up whenever we in the West talk about the East, talk about Asia. Why are gender roles so conservative in Asian countries? Confucianism. Why is it that Asian people work so hard? Confucianism. Why is it that certain Asian governments are so repressive of civil liberties? Confucius says. This would be like an Asian person writing about Western culture, whatever that is, as if American, French, and I don't know, Belgian cultures are all the same, even within their own countries, and saying, well, you have to understand, they're like this because they all descend from Platonism. You know, they're all holding Platonic ideals. It's the influence of Plato that we need to understand. Like, in some way, you're not incorrect. Ancient philosophy always has a long lineage of influence on modern thought. But I think modern-day British culture, for example, has a lot more influence from the world wars, or from the colonization of Asia, or Africa or the Caribbean, or even modern sports has a huge impact on British culture, including every major football club except Manchester City. Similarly, although patriarchy has existed in Asia for so long and Confucian ideals had such an effect there, to understand why Korea is the way it is today, we need to look at at least the past 600 years. The Joseon dynasty, which began in the late 14th century, is still meaningful in contemporary Korea. This is for several reasons, including that it brought in perhaps the greatest prosperity that Korea has ever known, that it was the time of the legendary King Sejong who invented Hangul, the Korean alphabet, renowned for its practicality and simplicity, and that it was the last kingdom of Korea, the one that fell to the Japanese empire. Technically, it was Tehan Cheguk, or the Korean Empire, that fell to Japan in 1910, but that state was more an ill-fated attempt to modernize rapidly, to try to keep up with Japan as it dominated the region, becoming a monarchical state with more Western influences. Now, during Joseon, before that, we see contradictions in the development of women's roles, ones that set the stage for today's state of gendered affairs. Now, don't get me wrong, the pattern continues. Women became more and more systematically persecuted, their sexualities became subjugated, and their husbands, which were usually compulsory husbands, not only being allowed to, but often encouraged to have concubines. However, the development of Joseon did allow for some women to have literacy. So it's basically an even thing. We also see Catholicism emerge in Korea among these literate women who would sometimes convert even though it was strictly prohibited to do so because Catholicism, get this, had a lot more potential for equality in it, at least in that region. It's interesting when you compare that to the compulsory hegemonic Catholicism that played its hand in colonizing so much of the world. Now, going back to the ending, the short-lived Korean Empire was ruled by the last king of Korea, Gojong. But in a lot of ways, it was for real for real headed by his wife, Queen Min who pushed in vain against traditionalists and aristocracy to modernize the state and resist Japanese rule before being assassinated brutally by Japanese agents. She is now seen as an early icon for Korean women and was posthumously named Empress Myungsung. But women who were not in her class position had no chance at such glory. It was after the official annexation of Korea to Japan that women were condemned to some of the worst realities of colonialism. The brutal Japanese occupation of Korea included reprehensible treatment of Korean women, exemplified by the taking of comfort women, or women and underage girls, who were kidnapped, sexually trafficked, and brutalized at the whims of Japanese soldiers. This practice took place in every area Japan colonized, and they've done a great job of acknowledging that since then. 
Wink. The thing about crisis periods like these is that they are often foundational for social change because they're hotbeds for resistance. And this was the case in Korea as well, with anti imperialist and anti colonial movements freely involving women across status and age groups. Thanks in no small part to the great growth of education for women during the Joseon period, women's rights popularized as a subject while many led the independent movements by raising military funds, taking charge of communications, working as nurses, and disseminating propaganda. In addition, almost all of women's daily existence entailed responsibility for the livelihood of their families and their children's education, which amounted to a struggle for helping independence activists to survive. It goes without saying that women's lives served as the foundation for the anti-Japanese national liberation movement. And Jesus comes back, as he does. Christian missionaries, including many women, were often seen as a key factor in modernizing Korean gender roles. Although this role is contested now by scholars like Hye Wo Choi and Yeon Sung Kim. The first women's rights declaration of Korea was published in 1898 eight years after the National American Women's Suffrage Association, and explicitly called on the country to change in line with women's rights movements around the world. Later that same month, the first school for girls was founded. Meanwhile, women activists were key contributors in labor movements and nationalist movements, participating in strikes and protests. The end of World War II saw a growth in the organization of Korean women's movements across the peninsula, but soon divided between the communist north and the capitalist south. War between the two led to widespread devastation. Once again, survival was a cudgel against gender liberation in Korea. That's not to say there weren't gains, and definitely not to say that women stopped fighting. Of note, for instance, were the factory girls, workers in factories for textiles, toys, and more, who produced cheap goods to export that were key to the development of the South Korean economy in the 50s and 60s. In Flowers of Fire, Chung writes that, Nearly 80% of the workers who made this possible, who struggled for up to 20 hours a day in dust-filled sweatshops, often taking stimulants to stay awake, were women, and half of them were teenagers as young as 13. Stigmatized and drastically underpaid, even when compared to exploited male workers in South Korea, these factory girls began to protest, despite the violence and repression they faced at the hands of their bosses. Chung follows one factory girl named Yoon Hyeryeon who later headed the first women's labor union, which in turn brought forth some improvements regarding things like maternity leave and the right to work after marriage and childbirth. Prior, it was common for women to be booted out in their 20s due to the mere expectation that they should become housewives. Eventually, as Chung writes, these women's labor unions fell by the wayside to male-dominated labor unions in South Korea's growing shipbuilding and automaking industries. Do a Google search for Yoon Hyeryeon, once a groundbreaking leader for women's rights and workers' rights, and she won't come up. But she was there. Women factory workers were not the only ones who made the miracle on the Han River, the phrase used to describe the country's astronomic economic expansion possible, but also the foremothers of South Korea's labor rights movement, Yoon said, but few remember our names now. Alright, let's talk about organizations. It's typical in every country for there to be organizations that contribute to campaigns for women's rights, like NOW, National Organization of Women in the U.S., as Chung writes in the book, the women's rights groups that gained prominence amidst and in the wake of constant war in Korea were more conservative ones, especially in the South, which made some gains as far as pushing for equal representation and treatment in the workplace. Their legacies, alongside the more left-wing women's movements that worked within and outside of said orgs, brought more changes than I can possibly name, including widespread movements against domestic violence, the formation of the gender equality ministry, History, and the eventual abolition of the Hoju system, which generally gave men power as de facto heads of household. But they also, as South Korea ruggedly navigated its independence as a capitalist nation, often worked in tandem with the government. Early on, they lent support to state-run birth control campaigns. In the 2016 book Kim Ji Young, born 1982 by Cho Nam Ju, which was a hit in South Korea, the titular protagonist suddenly starts acting strange. She starts embodying other women that have been in her life. 
She starts acting exactly like her mom, then an old friend of her and her husband's, then her mom again, until her husband is like, okay, I have to take you to a psychiatric facility. What the book is really about, through chronicling Ji Young's life and the lives of other women within it, is the overwhelming preference for sons in South Korean society and the overwhelming amounts of freedom, praise, and resources given to men at the expense of women. Cho, in an unusual turn for a fiction book, constantly cites statistics and studies to give historical context. She notes the ways that women's work, which they often took up to donates to the men in their family, was often outsourced by companies in the food and insurance industries, and thus given no legal protection. She notes the ratio of 116.5 boys to 100 girls in 1990, and the prevalence of aborting daughters as if daughter was a medical problem. Yes, believe it or not, there was a time when the Korean government actively encouraged women to not have children. At least, not have many children, let's say. Akin to what we discovered in our video on Singapore. Now, abortions are discouraged, and until the recent feminist wave, were criminalized. In a lot of Western countries, including the US, the fight for abortion access or abortion rights is often boiled down to the uh, release of conservatism versus women's rights activism. But in South Korea, it's a completely different story. For instance, when the government wants to increase the population, then often they, they try to tighten the rules on the abortion. But when the government wanted to decrease the population in order to, let's say, the, uh, the prevent the overpopulation, then the, the, there were a period of time in South Korea through the 60s and to 80s when the abortion was actively encouraged by the government. So the many women across the country were often encouraged to not only take birth control pills or death of birth control procedures, but even take abortion to show their patriotism. What this reflects is the role of the state, and of course not just the state, but the elites that the state generates and is manipulated by, in the lives of its citizens. Reproduction is dictated on high, and those in society who dissent, who say they don't want to be forced into living unbearable lives, bearing children for a regime that doesn't care about it, are roundly dismissed, are told that they don't care about Korean safety, about the prevalence, about the success of the nation moving forward. They're reminded sternly of the traumas of the nation's past. Being a woman rebelling against social norms is considered a betrayal. You just want us to go back to being poor, being colonized by Japan, being at war. Another function of these women's organizations, according to Chung, was to push anti-communist campaigns. All of this leads us to an uncomfortable truth. The specter of U.S. imperialism casts a shadow over 20th century Korean history. The U.S.'s desire to stomp out communism in the Pacific in order to protect its economic interests was a direct cause of the Korean War, the devastation of which cannot be overstated. And even the miracle on the Han River was not so miraculous. It was fueled by U.S. grants to the South Korean economy, hundreds of millions of dollars in the early 50s, and U.S.ians reaped the rewards of their investment by importing cheap, labor-intensive goods made by young Korean women with little to no autonomy or resources. We treated South Korea like a startup, built to undermine China and Russia as if they were competing megacorporations. We split a peninsula in two, devastating it economically and culturally, and built up one half of it so long as it remained a useful asset to our business. And as a result, the constant tension and trauma caused by geopolitics, caused by the memory and possibility of war, the destruction and hasty rebuilding of economies, in turn caused lasting issues, which have been considered less important to at best go unresolved. Naturally, moving on from the gender oppression of pre-modern Korea has been one of those issues. Again and again, women come second. Some of the valid pushback to the popularization of the 4B trend in the West is the seeming reluctance of Westerners to care even a little bit about Korean history, to do even a little bit of research about where these Korean cultural formations come from, and be accurate about the statistics. As if they're unimportant, as if what really matters is ultimately how people in the rest of the world can 
co-opt and change and mold their struggle into something that they can use for their own struggles, which is not quite the same as looking at struggles from throughout the world and fighting in cooperation and solidarity with other people. If we care to learn about it, it teaches us that in order to really act in solidarity with women around the world, we need to do more than co-opt their trends. Otherwise, we risk appropriating the struggles of Koreans for our own gain, as we always have done. If we care to learn about it, Korea's story shows us how geopolitical concerns create understandable fear in people, which leads them to hold on to dogmas that are irrational and hateful, simply because to let go is to supposedly enter the realm of the unknown, and that presents instability, and instability is associated with death and trauma. Very easy to manipulate by politicians, by the way. In the aforementioned Singapore video, we saw how Lee Kuan Yew's legacy has been glorified despite his repressive actions and eugenics policies because it was for stability. Check the comment section of that video, I promise you'll see many people making that argument. It's not really an argument though, is it? It's a trauma response. It's the cry of insecure people in positions of comfort towards social critics who demand change. How dare you threaten stability? you make me feel unsafe. That's why all these memes come out about how, you know, Gen Z is going to ruin the world and leftists, they just want us to go back to, to, to chaos or they just want everybody to have blue hair or something. That's what dogma does. It makes people feel safe. It's easier to live life if it's predetermined, if you just have to follow some obvious rules to win points and go up the leaderboard. Challenging your own ideas is scary because it can kill the villain inside of you the villain you internalized to make sense of and to get through the trauma that you were forced through. The villain you internalized so you don't feel so in danger when you encounter him in the real world. But holding on to the villain inside of you, as understandable and common as it is, is far more dangerous in the long run. So, the, the bear. You might be wondering why I am choosing to talk about two obnoxious online gender wars discourses rather than just one. I think the similarities are pretty obvious. Women commenting publicly about avoidance of men because of how dangerous or toxic they can be. Men reacting with confusion and frustration. But it's a little deeper. Man versus bear. The discourse. Do you realize you are systemically far less likely to be attacked in the woods by a bear than you are by a man? As reported by the North American Bear Center, for instance, the 750,000 black bears of North America kill less than one person per year on the average, while men ages 18 to 24 are 167 times more likely to kill someone than a black bear. The TikToker Yuval does a great job breaking down why everyone not just women, should choose the bear over the man. Not even just women, honestly, everybody should pick the bear. Reason number one, a bear is not gonna act any differently when it realizes there aren't any witnesses. The bear is gonna act like a bear. However, there are quite a few men who will act very differently upon the realization that nobody else is watching. Reason number two, bears do not wanna talk to you. If a bear knows you are in the woods, it will literally leave you alone. You will never see it. This is why the biggest safety advice to anybody who's camping in bear country is just to make noise. If you're with a group of people, have conversations. If you're by yourself, periodically just shout, bear. They also sell bells that you can hang on yourself if you're a solo Hiker that will continually make noise to let grizzlies and black bears know that you're in the area. So, so long as you do not surprise them, it is very unlikely that you will encounter a bear. Millions of people camp every single year all across bear country, and very few of them have any direct bear encounters at all, and very few of those bear encounters are ever even lethal. Whereas if a man is alone in the woods with a woman and they hear a noise, they will likely do the exact opposite and go towards that source where they know there is another person. Especially if this is a nefarious man who knows that the other person in the woods is smaller and weaker than them. Reason number three, bears do not want to attack people. If you get attacked by a bear it is almost certainly just due to one of two reasons. Either one, you startled it, or two, you ran across a mama bear with her cubs. And since you're alone with this bear, I think we can assume that this is not a mama bear with her cubs. However, there are men that do enjoy hurting and taking advantage of others, and will rush to the opportunity to do that once given the chance. Season number four, bears are very predictable. If you've ever gone camping before, you've likely been taught how to scare off a bear. You make yourself really big and make a lot of noise, and most of the time they just run off. Now tell me, if you were a woman alone in the woods, how would you scare off a man? 
there is not a fucking answer to that question. Remember, the question is not, would you rather get into a fist fight with a man or a grizzly bear? The question is, would you rather be stuck in the woods with either a man or a bear? And considering the bear almost certainly wants nothing to do with you and therefore will not pay you any attention, you should choose the bear. I think this gets at very closely where exactly the problem is with these gender wars discourses. This is something that FD Signifier has broken down in a recent video. People seem deeply unwilling to listen closely to questions and answer them with a breadth of knowledge. Not even just like so much knowledge, but just the ability to think critically based on different ideas of different things. Let's be more specific here. I think an animal rights activism understanding will have you understand that bears are not mean creatures. They're not these wild, vicious animals that just tear up every living being in sight, especially humans. The fact that we conceive of them as such to the point where such an easily answerable question like, would you rather come across a man or a bear in the woods, can be dismissed flippantly as a gender wars discourse and then answered based on where you stand on that discourse, speaks to another element of how colonialism poisons our brains because it is part of the colonial mentality to treat animals and nature as something to be dominated and something to be feared when not dominated and similarly women are also something that have historically been always paralleled with nature but especially in this case, as we've spoken about in the case of Korean history, are something to be dominated and something to be feared when not dominated. Do you kind of see where I'm going? It's these allegiances with colonial mentalities, with mentalities that are derived from the years and years of subjugation and domination of peoples that lead us to jump to these voracious conclusions and engage in these, not just unnuanced, because we'll talk about nuance later, but these very pointless debates that don't advance actual gender equality as is necessary, but instead oftentimes seek to engage with them in clickbait debates. This, I think, speaks to the fact that if you are not constantly critically thinking about your environment, whether it is about nature and the wildlife sense, or it is about the nature of gender, or it's about capitalism, etc., then your information and your understanding of all of those other issues is also going to suffer. Because you lack a good animal rights understanding, and I'm certainly no expert in that field, that will lead you only more into the direction of misunderstanding other topics and treating them dogmatically. You may be wondering also how this connects to the 4B movement and why I'm choosing to talk about it in this video about the 4B movement. Is our understanding of it also connected to animal rights? Well, I definitely think it's connected to one animal in particular, the elephant in the room. I'm sorry. One of the biggest critiques I've seen of the 4B movement out west is by Kyla Xia, who points out some real problems with its origins. Look. A transphobic comment but it's actually really fitting because you know it's also transphobic a lot of feminism in South Korea a lot of online feminist spaces require you to prove that you are a cis woman you either have to upload an ID or a lot of them require you to submit a photo of your Adam's Apple so all the women in the West who are like oh my god 4B is so great you like that part of it because guess what look at this 4B in the West page very turfy I think people in the West are overly fixated on the interpersonal romantic side of the 4B practice and are ignoring or don't care about all of the larger societal issues that cause feminist groups to come up with the 4Bs. Because people don't actually want to do the hard work of learning about the issues in their society. They just want to be able to look at a cute little acronym and be like, all right, that's all I need to know. But that's unfortunately just not how it works. I also think there's a lot of Orientalism and fetishizing East Asia going on here, but I'll leave that for another time. A Twitter user recently went viral for lambasting a TikTok of a Korean woman, the one from earlier, who was talking about how the 4B movement is comprised of extreme misandrists. That user's bio describes her as a gender critical feminist. One of her many other tweets. Fact. Transgender women are not women. The rest speaks for itself. This is a problem within online and occasionally offline Korean feminism. A lot of people there are interested in fighting for women's rights at the cost of other people's rights. To understand this, let's go back to Merce. 
Do you remember MERS, the disease? MERS Gallery was started in 2015 as a section of the Korean forum DC Inside to discuss the spread of Middle East Respiratory Syndrome and its outbreak in Korea, which apparently started with a man bringing it to Korea from the Middle East. At some point, two Korean women apparently got MERS while traveling from Korea to Hong Kong and refused to be quarantined. Can you imagine people selfishly refusing to quarantine to avoid spreading a respiratory illness? First time I'm hearing of it. Koreans on the forum were pissed about these women. And as it goes on the internet, critiquing women's character quickly devolved into misogyny. Some referred to them as kimchi bitches and dwinchang girls, mocking a cultural phenomenon of young women choosing cheap meals to avoid luxury lifestyle choices. Misogyny has long been a common characteristic within online spaces, and South Korea's internet is no exception, noted by the rise of forums like Irbe, which are hard far right. So the women on this forum, pissed off at this, decided to do something they called mirroring, or giving back to men what they're giving to women. And thus, from Merce Gallery rose Megalia, or Megalion.com, a short-lived website of the feminist and feminist-adjacent women who were banned from DC Inside for their hostile comments. Their infamous symbol, the hand-pinching gesture, became a calling card of popular feminism in Korea. I'm going to be very cautious about how I discuss this because I am a man and I don't want to overstep in terms of my critiques. But I will say, for one, this pinching hand gesture is perfectly emblematic of what's good and bad with this particular section of Korean feminism, which again, that's a small section of Korean feminism. It's a much larger spectrum. But I say that it is emblematic of those two things because its strength is that it pisses men off. So this, you know, it refers to men having small dicks, right? It's it's a joke that can be annoying, infuriating, emasculating, whatever. But that's also speaking to the weaknesses of it because that's basically all it does. It's not extremely thoughtful about how it talks about sex or how it talks about bodies in general or gender in general. It is particularly focused on pissing off the man in front of you, the man on the forum that you're talking to, etc. And there's a space for this, I understand. I'm not gonna sit here and yell at people for making fun of people who have been horrendously making fun of them, but I'm also going to wonder whether or not sometimes moving towards this path without adding an additional amount of focus on other aspects of gender politics, other aspects of progressing gender politics can be a large weakness as well because especially it can devolve into the hate being sort of the most powerful aspect of that section of activism. Does this make sense? Do I do I sound weird? Or am, I, am I speaking too uncertainly right now? Am I a bit too boring right now? Because I want to talk about TERFs and that's the reason that I'm doing this critique. It's not something that I would bother to talk about otherwise, but similar to how in the West we have a problem wherein gender politics and, and feminist movements have some co-opting it to push anti-transgender ideas. This appears to be a significant issue in South Korea with a recent issue where a student who was a transgender woman applied to a women's university, got in, and then being bullied by feminist groups from several other women's universities who called her a man and said that she should not apply, she should not be allowed in, she resigned her application. She decided not to go in. When I reached out through my community posts to talk to my audience about this 4B subject, there were a couple of commenters who had some upvotes even, and they were pretty enthusiastic about 4B in the West, and they seemed like they were really excited about the prospect of having a spirited, positive, well-intentioned conversation about this, who felt like this 4B movement really represented something revolutionary almost in the West. And they would recommend these creators who I should look into to get a fuller perspective on the larger conversations being had within these spaces. And so I looked into them. And when I searched their Twitter ads and the word trans, not only did they have nothing advocating for trans rights, they came through with hot takes about trans women having an aggressive sense of entitlement, that they literally think they can change biology. That's the case of one creator. Another creator who was suggested to me makes videos about reactionary anti-trans content with titles like, trans people are taking this too far, shocking, and transgender tries to breastfeed baby, do they think they can? 
must watch. And this can be connected to this online feminism burst in the mid 2010s, particularly in the case of Megalia. So if you remember, Megalia was the reaction to the hate the misogyny that was occurring on Korean forums. And they started mirroring and they made this forum and they were talking all this crap about men on there or whatever, and also having feminist conversations. And that forum eventually splintered off pretty quickly, actually, into several different forums, notably the one called Womand, based on one main controversy, uh, as it seems, which is whether or not it's okay to be homophobic against gay men. What? The feminist groups that 4B came out of, they're also very against gay men. One of South Korea's first online feminism spaces, there was actually a huge split in 2015 over gay men because the mods were like, we're gonna ban the use of these very homophobic slurs that you're doing. Also, we don't love that you're outing gay men. Um, and so like a lot of people were like, no, we want to do that stuff. So we're going to go create our own site, WOMAD. And it goes beyond not being friends with the LGBTQ community. A lot of members of these online feminism spaces, they are anti-intersectionality. They think that intersectionality is a distraction from feminism. And they also don't want to do anything that could possibly help men. That's going to exclude a lot of stuff. The most obvious one to me is race. And what I know about South Korean culture, it's very colorist and also pretty anti-black, much like other East Asian countries. This type of reactionary feminism sadly maintains a presence online, though it seems fairly small most of the time. The core of the argument is always, as this one rad femme puts it, that they make trans MFs the center of literally everything. Let's put aside that these are the people who actively seek out right-wing propaganda clips of trans people specifically meant to engender anti-trans ideas and get hits dunking on them. Let's put aside that if it weren't for black trans women, including one who was prominent during the Stonewall riots, and countless trans activists after her, there would have been way fewer gains for lesbians today. There's this idea that happens, and it's not just in feminism, it's in every sphere where we are trying to do social justice, where people are like, why do we have to talk about anything else? We're here to talk about this one thing. Why give these other things our attention? In this case, this is about reproductive rights and cis women. Why do trans people want all this attention? Why do we have to talk about disability? But this is the thing. Everyone fighting for liberation needs allies. And all issues of oppression are interconnected. That's not just sentiment. When you say that mental illness is the only reason why somebody should not have access to a gun, you are doing two things. One, you're ignoring the fact that mentally ill people are more likely to be victims than perpetrators of violence. Second of all, you're failing to realize that in a society where any marginalization can be read as a mental illness, anybody can be disarmed. You're seeing this with transness being a mental illness and therefore we need to eradicate and disarm them. What you're also gonna start to see it with is cis women. Are you really a victim of sexual violence or domestic violence or are you just hysterical? It is the solidarity built between different movements that helps build up one movement. Unfortunately, some people on these online forums don't seem to get it. Here's a post from Megalia that I found in a long scholarly piece detailing a person's experience being part of these forums. Feminism will be doomed if we care for disability rights and homosexual rights. 역사적으로 사회가 페미니즘을 얼마나 억압해 왔는지 아십니까? 장애인 권리와 동성애 권리 장애인 사회에서도 남성 장애인은 여성 장애인을 차별합니다. 동성애 커뮤니티에서도 개인은 레즈비언을 차별합니다. 여성의 권리만 챙기면 나머지는 따라올 것입니다. This is all to put aside how the very idea of gender as some sort of natural thing does not service women's movements at all, and how conversations about trans people, about gender in general, about non-binary gender identities, and more, are actually helpful for all women and for all people. Content creators and hot take artists don't understand how actual activism works, and they don't have to. That's not their job. Their job is to go on here, like me, and talk to a camera for attention. And it works sometimes. It really works sometimes, especially when you can sell yourself as being the face of a very important movement. But you're either fighting oppression or you're not. There is no room for strategically ignoring or harassing certain oppressed groups in order to build up your own. It doesn't work, it never has, and it's part of what splintered these spaces online in South Korea. 
Even in South Korea, many feminists on the ground understand this better than anyone. When I spoke to ha Won, she told me about how feminists throughout history, especially in the past 40-50 years, linked up into disability movements, into labor movements, democracy movements overall, because they recognized not only that these issues were interconnected, but that this helps to bring better for everybody involved. I think the, uh, the South Korea still has a long way to go when it comes to the understand the, uh, the whole concept of intersectionality. Although I would say that, that if you actually see that the history of the feminist movement in South Korea, if you actually see the, how it manifests itself on the ground, they just know it, the concept of intersectionality very instinctively. For instance, a lot of uh, the older generation of feminists, a lot of them used to be a pro-democracy activist, and also a lot of them were deeply involved in the pro-labor rights in South Korea, then a lot of them then later realized that, oh, without feminism, the, the electoral democracy will be never complete. We really need the feminist approach to a lot of issues that we previously fought for, whether that was better labor rights or more political freedom. And they went on to find, found a lot of mainstream women's rights groups under the slogan of the feminism perfects democracy. This may be slightly different from the usual conversation about intersectionality in the U.S., but I'm just saying that the feminist movement in South Korea also has it's a very multifaceted aspect of it. And it's not just about women, that they have a very long history of basically collaborating and fighting side by side with a lot of different and diverse groups. And of course, queer rights and women's rights not only have crossover, but are deeply connected. Despite progressing views from South Koreans on sexuality, the anti-feminist president, Yoon suk yeol in addition to, for instance, threatening to abolish the gender ministry, has also failed to protect LGBTQ rights. It seems like the only major progress made was a 2023 ruling against healthcare discrimination towards same-sex couples. Lawmakers across the political spectrum continue to oppose protections for LGBTQ plus people in a stalling non-discrimination bill. One example of the direct crossover between women's rights and gay rights is in the inability for women to gain key financial and legal protections outside of heterosexual marriage in South Korea. Hao An Jung herself recently reported on a phenomenon of women legally adopting their female roommates in order to gain legal protections, such as being able to sign medical consent forms, which by law, only family can do. These women, a lot of them are no marriage women, and some of them are even for be uh, movement followers. Those women have been mocked and ridiculed by so many people online and offline that, oh, they are going to grow old alone in misery, in poverty. But if you actually look at these women, a lot of them take the issue of care very seriously. Some other women, they started to live with another middle-managed women and bought the house together so that they can really live together for the rest of their lives. Some others also even create community-based health care cooperative so mm. that they can kind of care for each other while they grow old together. Same-sex marriage is not allowed, it's not legal yet. So the only way for these roommates who live together to become a legal family is basically one adopting the other as uh, daughters. Although the public chatter about phobia movement or the feminist movement in general have died down in recent years, a lot is happening under the radar. These women are really trying to find new ways of life out of the uh, traditional bound of a family. So I just think that what these women are really interesting and we will really have to see how they are going to keep challenging this, you know, old traditional and patriarchal way of our life. What this shows us is that feminists in South Korea are once again using their ingenuity and perseverance to survive and fight for change under intersecting forms of oppression. It's easy to get caught up in the internet trolls and the spicy trends and think they are representative of Korean feminism. But as always, quietly, the real work of gender liberation is being done by Korean women who are swept under the rug by a world that seeks to exploit them. There's a debate about whether misandry actually exists. My take is that I don't think it matters. As a man, I don't think it matters whether or not you can say it exists. You don't have to call TERFs misandrists to see that they have a problem with homophobia, with transphobia, with sometimes racism, ableism. You don't have to suggest that these folks have anywhere near the power of the misogynists that run the world in everyday life. 
The idea of Miss Sandry existing or not is kind of a distraction from a larger conversation, which is gender equality is better for everybody. And feminists fight for gender equality. Hateful people are out there. We see them every day, and they are not the people who are leading us into a better world. The question is, do they see themselves? 결론, 보따리. I have a request for you, whoever you are watching this video, whether you've paid attention so far or not. I want you to close your eyes and picture yourself as a Korean woman. If you're already a Korean woman, you can skip this step. Kim Suja is an artist from Daegu, South Korea. Her work makes you conscious of your own gaze, as all good art does. She began working on art in grade school, with a particular interest in philosophy that fleshed out over time, through her journey gaining a BFA and MFA from Honggik University, and realized in the early 1990s when preparing for a show in Korea, she had been doing both art and philosophy. Hate when that happens. Her work involves multiple disciplines, but often centers on concepts of sewing and threads, beginning in the 1980s. Her fascination with ordinary, pragmatic objects led to her famous usage of the botari. Botari is a type of bundle, Kim says, is actually everywhere in our country. We always keep botari, which means bundle in Korean, in our family, to keep things and protect them, or to put aside in the attic, or to carry from one place to another. Also in Korea, making a bundle when it refers to women means leaving the family. That is, the woman leaves her own family to pursue her own life. Kim will readily discuss how her work tackles the complex subjectivity and subjugation of women in Korean society. After first tackling Botari during her residency in New York in the early 90s, her return to Korea reobserving its place in everyday Korean life, she realized as a woman artist the conflict in our society in terms of women's position and women's role. Living in New York for one year had changed my point of view, and I saw Korean society more critically and the condition of women there more frustrating. She doesn't call her art feminist, preferring to say it's humanist, and though I think politically that's maybe not a strong position in some perspectives, because feminism should be humanist, that's the whole point, I think I see what she's getting at. When I saw her installations at Tanya Banakdar Gallery in Manhattan, the centerpiece was this large mirrored platform that you had to wear special socks they distributed to walk atop. The experience is one of the most on the nose for Kim's typical thematic approach. Her work asks you to reflect on your own gaze. In a piece entitled Suja Kim's Wrapping Cloth, The Aesthetics of Paradox, digital culture professor Ju Eun Lee describes her work as experiencing and analyzing two different gazes, two different perceptions of the art based on where it is situated. One is a commentary of South Korean masculinist hegemony. Here's your prodigious, super serious artist, and she's making botari and walking around with it like an average traditional Korean woman ignored in the private sphere. The other is of Western hegemony. Here you see something oriental, something Korean and thus exotic. But in reality, it's just art about personhood, about experiences that are deeply connected to yours. And because you are so ready to otherize, you won't see it. Lee writes, Depending on which context the work is placed in, Suja Kim's work is critical. Of traditional Korean Confucianism by disguising itself as tradition, or of the Western viewpoint that looks upon her works as having an Eastern appearance. Sometimes I think I emphasize complexity too much. I'm starting to worry that that's what you think I am. I'm the nuance guy. I add nuance. The point of this video is not just to say the thing you think is simple and trendy is actually complicated. As Kieran Healy writes in his well-titled paper, Fuck Nuance, it is often easier to embrace complexity than to cut through it. Assuming you've taken the time to observe all this complexity we've talked about, let's cut right through it. It's easy to think of feminism as the negation, the removal of men. But the story of women in Korea is, in many ways, the story of all of us. It is the story of being stuck, forced into class positions to keep the empire running, only able to change things 
when we choose to work together and see the ways different forms of oppression are connected. So I don't want you to search for complexity, actually. I want you to search for connectivity. I want you to start to see yourself in the eyes of others and see others as if you were seeing yourself. Ow. Hi, I'm live with Babilla and Sonic the Hedgehog, and I'm about to talk to him for my Patreon, where we do exclusive conversations. If you'd like to subscribe to my Patreon, it would be very nice if you did that, because it helps support the channel. So, thank you for watching. <laughs> <laughs>